Thank you. Thank you, kids. Thank you so much. Give it up for them one more time. One more time. Thank you, kids. All right. Teach us your way, O oh Lord, that we may walk in your truth. Give us undivided hearts to honor your name. Let us hear what our Lord will speak.
Surely his salvation is at hand for those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground and righteousness will look down from the sky. His love for me. 
got nothing new How could I express All my gratitude I could sing these songs As I often do But every song must stay So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I've nothing else fit for a king except for a heart singing. Just one move with my arms stretched wide. I will worship you. So I throw up my head, praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a of water so my soul pants for you my God my soul thirsts for God for the living God when can I go and meet with God why my soul are you downcast why so disturbed within me put your hope in God for I will yet praise him my Savior my God by day the Lord directs his love at night his song is with me a prayer to the God of my life why why my soul are you downcast why so disturbed within me put your hope in God for I will yet praise him my Savior and my God so I throw up my head praise you again and again cause all that I have is the hallelujah Not much, but I've nothing else fit for a king except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. Go ahead and bow for prayer. Reflect, throw up my hands. 
blessings and I praise you again and again. It's all that I have is a hallelujah. Just to simply say thank you. Thank you, God. Reflect on his goodness in your life. The old hymn writer says, count your blessings, name them one by one, and it will su surprise you what the Lord has done. Take a moment, think about it. All the blessings that God has given you. Lord, in the quietness of these moments, we remind ourselves, we remind each other of how good you are and how good you have been in the ways that you have blessed us as your people. So undeserving of all these blessings and yet you pour them, you bestow them on us. Thank you. Thank you, God. So I throw up my hands and I praise you again and again. And again, one moment is not enough to say thank you. Help us to live lives of gratitude every day. This is our prayer. Everybody say amen. 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 You may be seated for a while. Pastor Jeff. Yes. Come on up, sir. I'd like to invite Ryan and Margaret and Elizabeth Sage McCampbell to come forward. Maybe you could come right over here. So it is very special to be able to be here with you. I had the honor of being able to marry you, and it looks like it, that took. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and, and here's... Uh, Elizabeth Sage, and today she will be baptized. And baptism, we believe, is a sign of God's promise that he has chosen her, she is God's child, and God will never leave her, never forsake her, never let her go. It's like this wedding ring. Baptism does not save her. But baptism is the sign of God's commitment to her forever and ever. And so, Ryan and Margaret, do you acknowledge Elizabeth's need of the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ and the renewing grace of the Holy Spirit? Do you? Do you claim God's covenant promises for Elizabeth? And do you look in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ for her salvation as you do for your own? We do. do you now unreservedly give your child to God? And do you promise in humble reliance upon divine grace? And, and that you need as parents, divine grace. Is that not correct? that you will endeavor to set before Elizabeth the example of what it means to follow Jesus, and that you will teach her all about the faith, and that you will strive in all ways that you can imagine to, to raise her among the family of God and with friends and at home and and all the ways that you can imagine to know Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. She was paying attention to me, by the way. So, and for the congregation, do you as a congregation and Christian friends and family undertake the responsibility of assisting Margaret and Ryan and the rest of the family that's right here in the nurture and uh, development of the faith of Elizabeth Sage, do you? We do. 
to think she oh she look at this she can't wait to be with me <laughs> Elizabeth Sage McCampbell I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit amen Lord we pray that you make this young lady great in your eyes maybe not great in the eyes of the world but make her into a woman who knows you, who loves you, and who will be a witness to you in whatever endeavors you have for her in her life. We pray this, Lord, in Jesus' holy name. Amen. And yes, Elizabeth, look out there. That's your family. <laughs> Sing. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. We do have a children's Bible for you, and we also have the certificate of baptism, but also a $50 check for you to invest into her first mission trip uh, whenever she's ready. That probably won't be real soon, but <laughs> one of these days. God bless you. Thank you so much. Welcome our new member of the Christ of the Church. Uh, our children can be dismissed now and please uh, stand up and find someone you haven't talked to for, or maybe met before and greet a couple people. How great is that touching the next generation and seeing families emerge? What an exciting thing that touches uh, and for generations and generations, God has built his church that way. Um, we're in a series about our identity and ultimately bringing that identity into unity in Christ. Here's, here's the reality that the Bible knows that we're going to look at. Um, our identity gets so fragmented. Our 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 hearts are like a really bad committee meeting <laughs> uh, on, on the best of their days. And, uh, and yet there is a place where when we tell the truth to ourselves about that, when we embrace who we really are and when we cry out for deliverance, we find great help. And we're looking at a passage that deals with the complexity of this. It's written by one of the best Christians who ever lived uh, at a point where he was all in for Jesus Christ by the Apostle Paul in Romans 7. And yet we're going to find him declaring, and I want you to pay attention as I read the Word of God to you. We're going to find him declaring in the present tense some things that remain true about himself. Uh, they're not ultimately designed um, to define him as his worst self or to defeat him, but if he doesn't embrace that reality, he will never develop. Uh, we have to face the truth. We talked about our, our shadow self uh, that trails us. Uh, like a shadow that is behind us seeking to sabotage. We've talked about the fact that in all of us, 
There is a, a part of us that is a worse friend than we would ever be to someone else. <laughs> we would never say to a friend out loud some of the things that we allow to pass through our own heart to ourselves. Uh, and we are unreliable narrators. But in the midst of that, there's a way to cut through it. Again, if we will tell the truth uh, about this divided self, uh, if we'll embrace who we are and cry out for deliverance, there is hope and help. So I'm going to begin reading from this section of the Word of God. And like I like to say, uh, the only thing perfect that I will say from this platform will be this inspired reading of the Word of God. So um, give God reverence and attention as you hear his Word. Romans 7. And I'm reading from the Christian Standard Bible, a little more literal wooden translation than the New International for today. The Word of God. Romans 7, verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold as a slave under sin. For I do not understand what I am doing because I do not practice what I want to do, but I do what I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, I agree with the law that it is good. So now, I am no longer the one doing it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my flesh. For the desire to do what is good is with me, but there is no ability to do it. Now, if I do what I do not want, I am no longer the one that does it but it is the sin that lives in me. So I discover this law. When I want to do what is good, evil is present with me. For in my inner self, I delight in God's law, but I see a different law in the parts of my body, waging war against the law of my mind, and taking me prisoner to the law of sin in the parts of my body. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with my mind, I myself am serving the law of God, but with my flesh, the law of of sin. Let us pray again. Father, we pray through the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that inspired these humble, realistic words of autobiography, uh, that that same Spirit would come. And Lord, break the word of life to us. We thank you that you have promised that when we know the truth, the truth sets us free. So may that truth ring out and do good for us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The first thing I want you to see, the first point, is really that we need to tell the truth about ourselves to ourselves. Uh, we need to tell the truth about ourselves to ourselves. And this is one of, one of the difficult tasks. Uh, somebody said, integrity is telling myself the truth. It's, it's honesty that tells the truth to other people. That's a little bit easier, to tell the truth to other people. But it is integrity that tells the truth uh, about ourselves. And integrity means that, you know, how we become a whole person. The word integrity comes from that word integer. Uh, and what is the wholeness of the reality in ourselves? And the problem is, uh, in ourselves, there is this bad committee meeting that has at least a minority voice that is speaking to us. Uh, but we, we long to have that place of integrity. Um, I find these words of Warren Buffett uh, both amusing but realistic. He said that when you look for people to hire, you look for three qualities, integrity, intelligence, and energy. And if you don't have the first, uh, the other two will kill you. <laughs> he, he says, in other words, when you think about it, if you hire somebody without integrity, you really want them to be dumb and lazy. <laughs> this is the, the reality of the fall, is that uh, and of the fall into sin, is it attacked us in the place of being able to be wholehearted uh, and, and to unite our heart uh, to love God with our all. It attacked us in, in that very quarter. 
Uh, and so the other parts of our faculty that, that maybe we don't see as fallen, our integrity, our smarts, or our sense of energy, um, they mean nothing if we don't come to this, this holistic understanding. And, and in this passage, um, Paul faces and tells the truth to himself um, about himself. Uh, but he does it in a way that says that this, this part of him, that it can, remains to flawed and remains a sabotage, uh, is not really who he is, but it's there. <laughs> it's, it's, it's there ready to undermine him. Um, and he is facing this reality in a way that shows that, that he is a converted person talking. In other words, the way he talks about himself to himself right now is not the way a, a religious moralist or an unconverted person talks about themselves because he is willing to face the truth and, and denounce himself. He's able to say, in my flesh there dwells no good thing. And he says, that is in my, in my flesh. He's not saying there's nothing good in him because he says the spirit of God is in me. But he's willing to denounce himself in a way that he never would have done before his conversion. Uh, before the Apostle Paul was converted, he felt pretty good about himself. Um, he felt that he was, in terms of the law, he says in Philippians 3, I was keeping it according to legalistic righteousness. I was flaw flawless. I was faultless. Uh, you'll find that there is a kind of humility and a kind of self-distrust in a person who really knows Jesus Christ that is not present in someone who is a mere moralist. And we find this in the Apostle Paul. In other words, he knows that there is a line of good and evil that strikes through his heart that is not yet fully died. It's on the cross, it's being crucified, <laughs> but it has not yet been fully put away. I find this uh, quote is one of the most stirring quotes from um, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, a dissident under the Soviet Union. And he writes this about evil. He says, this is so important. And I think this is, this is truly a Christian view. It's a nuanced view. It's a thoughtful, considerate view of good and evil. When he says the line separating good and evil passes not through states, nor between classes, nor between political parties either, but right through every human heart. And through all human hearts. So that, that is a Christian position. That is a humble position. That is a position that fills you with a kind of self-distrust without self-disdain. And then, to add to the complexity, he says the line shifts <laughs> inside us. He says it oscillates, you know, like the oscillating fan. It's moving, it's a constant moving target. How we are actually gonna find a way to undermine ourselves, it's very creative. <laughs> Um, it oscillates with the years. In other words, he's saying the kind of things that our flesh does to us when we're in our 20s changes because it doesn't work the same way maybe when we're in our 40s or 50s, and it shifts, but then sometimes it'll decide, okay, there is an advantage there. <laughs> it oscillates with the earth. Even within hearts overwhelmed by evil, this is also part of the Christian position, even in a person who you say, this person is overtaken by evil, a small bridgehead of good is retained. <laughs> So the Christian position is one of, of a lot of nuance. Um, and if you don't get your anthropology, your study of who, the, who you are in your humanness right, you'll never understand who God is. And, and so what I'm saying, and what Paul is saying here, I believe very clearly, uh, is that Romans 7, um, the good I would do, I don't find myself doing, I'm able to decide it, but I'm not able to implement it. Um, that is a description of part of the human experience. It's not the totality of the Christian experience, but it is realistic to know that there are discouragements and conflicts and defeats that we will often encounter if we take sin seriously and seek to do battle with it. Uh, and so it describes Paul's heart, it describes your human heart, my human heart, the best Christian on the planet Earth, is more aware of the need to, to a degree of humility and self-distrust. Uh, in some ways, it sounds like a tormented person, but it's a person who is free by looking at reality. And, and again, this is not who he was in his pre-Christian days. In his pre-Christian days, he was absolutely confident 
Um, he was as to zeal. He was even willing to persecute and snuff out uh, the church that he later discovered was true. Um, there was very little self-doubt and, and self-concern in the Apostle Paul. But he saw that there was, there was this conflict. So um, he's embracing it. Again, he's embracing it saying that um, I'm of the flesh sold as a slave to sin. He's saying that there, when I'm obeying sin, I answer it just... Um, so easily, I'm easily brought under the command and control of sin. Um, he says, I don't understand some of the things that I'm doing. I, you know, this is so freeing. <laughs> we can actually say, we don't even understand ourselves. And we find ourselves practicing things that we hate. This is the description of someone who's telling the truth to themselves. Um, he goes on and says, I know that nothing good lives in me, but then he qualifies it. That is in my flesh. You won't find many non-Christian people saying that. <laughs> saying, I know that nothing good dwells in me. But you'll also find he qualifies. He says, I'm talking about my flesh. And he's not talking about an equal counterpart to himself, but he's saying that he drags around with him that shadow self, that unreliable narrator, uh, that person who continually sabotages him, uh, and that it, it is ever right there with him. So this is part of the complexity that we've, we've got to be aware of, and it results in an uncharacteristic kind of humility, uh, both a, a humility that aspires to be better, but a humility that will tell the truth to ourselves. Uh, and so this, in over 40 times in Romans 7, Paul uses the first person to, as an autobiography, <laughs> saying, I, I don't understand. And, and this good, he says, oh, the only good remaining in him is what God put in him. I love what uh, one of my mentors used to do when uh, used to be lines of people leave the sermon and say, good sermon, good sermon, good sermon, good sermon. You know? And he, he, he developed what I think was one of the best responses to that. He says, um, well, what was good about it is from God and the rest of it I'll take credit for. Uh, that's a Christian response. In, in the sense of saying, um, it's God in us. It's the life I live now, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And, and it also points to the glory of God for whatever, wherever there is obedience. Uh, that the glory of God is, is in that. Uh, and, and so he's, he's speaking of this um, in a powerful way that tells the truth to himself. But he also is embracing embracing the real him, um, embracing who he really is. And I love this. Now, um, you can try this on your spouses sometime when you have done something wrong. You can say, now, if I do not do what I, if I did what I didn't want to do, it's, I'm no longer the one who did it, but it's just sin that lives in me. Um, try that. I, I try to, you know, one of the hard things about being a, a quote, um, empty nester, my wife likes to call it the revolving door because they do come back. We just wish they'd come back more often and frequently and, you know, is that there's no one else to blame. Um, and, and, and so I've been trying, my memory's been going back to how my kids did it, um, how they could shift blame. You know, it's like the recent event was, you know, who, you know, opened the cheese and sliced some and didn't put it in a sealed plastic bag, you know, and I was like, it couldn't have been me. It had to be someone else. And she's like, well, I bought it two days ago. I don't think there's been anyone in the house since. I remember um, when our youngest child was four, he created two people called Ghosty and Ghostus. It was Ghostus if there were two of them, and Ghosty was one. And he would always say, I think it must have been Ghosty and Ghostus do. But I want you to see, there's a little bit of this going on in this passage that is actually really freeing, that Paul, again, continually says, it is sin dwelling in me. And this is one of the reasons I use the Christian Standard Bible is because in the, at least the older original New International Version, it uses the word sinful nature. And it sets us up as if there are two natures inside of us. And the Bible does not teach that there are two natures inside of us. The Bible teaches that, that we are fallen, in, in a unity fallen, and that we are shot through with sin affecting us in every part of us. It doesn't teach that we're as bad as we could be. We're not a, you know, a, a jar of full-strength cyanide. But it teaches that if we are a 16-ounce cool beverage of your choice, that there's been a drop of cyanide placed and stirred throughout the mix, and so that we're affected by sin in all of our parts. Again, this is meant to both humble us and to make us real. 
Um, uh, and so he's not saying that there are two equal voices of identity, but he is saying that there is a saboteur. He is saying there's an unreliable narrator. He is saying that there is um, Edward Hyde, <laughs> the story of Dr. Jekyll and Edward Hyde, that is hiding down within us. And so he's saying we are always capable of this. Um, and so he's, he's not exonerating himself, but he is explaining this is not who he intends to be. Um, I sometimes have heard the apologies, and again, it's very hard to find any real apologies in uh, our contemporary media where someone actually really apologizes. And one of the fake apologies that I don't think quite passes biblical mustard is when we say, I'm sorry, that's not who I am. <laughs> have you ever heard anybody say that? I'm sorry that I did that, that's not who I am. And I think that's, that's a little bit of a false truth. It, it, and so what I've tried to say when I apologize is to say, I'm sorry that's who I was, <laughs> obviously, because you are what, we are in part what we did. I'm sorry I did that, that's who I was. It's not who I want to be. It's not who I ultimately am called to be in Jesus Christ. And it's not who I purpose to be ahead. So from now on, I will, when I open the cheese, I will put it back in the sealed <laughs> container. I will not cite Ghosty and Gustus, but in, in more definitive ways. Um, again, the trustworthy person is not the person who never needs to repent, right? <laughs> the trustworthy person is the person who will openly embrace where they have fallen and move forward. Um, one of my favorite biographies um, that I read rather recently and continue to kind of study is it's an authorized, it's not an autobiography, it's an authorized biography where um, the writer Eugene Peterson who said his goals in old age were to be a sage, a source of wisdom, and a saint uh, in, in a more definitive sense, one who's really just set apart and holy for God. Um, and so he gave one writer um, access to all of the, his journals, and he wrote very, he wrote the kind of journal that you would want to have a best friend go and burn those journals up if something happened to you so that nobody else would read them. Does anybody else journal like that? I think we're all afraid to journal like that, right? Uh, but he wrote those kind of journals. Uh, and he gave this author of his autobiography um, access. And so, highly respectable person. If you don't know a lot about Eugene Peterson, he translated the entire Bible into American vernacular, um, known as kind of a guru of real authentic spirituality. But three things about this biography really impressed me with this, with this healthy sense of, of who he is and yet of humility and self-distrust. Um, and, and the first one is that um, in his 80s, when he retired to uh, a, his hometown and a, and a place, a little cabin on a lake in Montana, um, he writes in his journal that he'd been having discussions with his wife of 60 years. And he said, I'm wondering if even after 60 years of marriage, I'm going to have to humble myself and submit to marriage counseling because I seem to be unable to get over the fact that I like to process things internally and quietly and that my wife needs me to process more things out loud and I know this is what love requires but I can't seem to get myself to do it and so we have this unnecessary conflict and so in his 80s, having translated the whole of the Bible, he's saying to get over this shadow self and bring myself some accountability, I, need some, I may need some marriage counseling. Oh, that made me just love him more. <laughs> Um, I, I, a second part of, of his book, um, he, he writes that um, his evening habit of looking out at the lake and enjoying just a glass of wine had become a fixation on his heart that he was realizing caused him to lose the rest of the evening because it often led to a second or a second and a half or third glass of wine. And so he muses, he says, have I, in my 80s, become an alcoholic, reliant upon alcohol to do something for me in relaxing me. And so he questions himself and then says, I need to abstain entirely. I need to cut this out of my life because of weakness, all, all those decades. And what I found is that when we're living close to Jesus Christ, then we find ourselves in this kind of humble, hopeful, self-distrust um, readiness to really label ourselves by, by ourselves as to who we are. 
Uh, that's the mark of spirituality. The mark of spirituality is not the person who has become the, the you know, don't doubt yourself, I am all super spirit-filled, uh, but the mark of being spirit-filled is you recognize the part of you that is lagging behind, that is not leading the way, but is more like your, your leg is chained to a log, and you've got to acknowledge that that's part of the drag. And so, so this is part of what the Apostle Paul is doing. He's making that so, so clear. Um, and this is a powerful thing in the life of the Apostle Paul, and it's a powerful thing in the life of those who know him. I want to just say that about repentance. The most godly people I've known have been the people who um, repent quickly, repent fully, uh, and repent often. And I would just ask you this question. If you love Jesus uh, and you've devoted your life to him, how often during the events of your day do you think you've got to have a sidebar with him and say, Ooh, oh yeah, I got out of alignment, I need to acknowledge that. How many times a day? One time? One time might be progress for us. <laughs> Two times, three times, 10 times? And I'm not talking about repentance as like this hair shirt of you know, punishment and flagellation. It's more like gazing back in the eyes of the one who we want to be like and, and the one that we are living in apprenticeship with and saying, this is who I wanna be, this is not who I just was, and it's who now I'm gonna acknowledge, embrace, uh, and be going forward. Uh, this, is, this is spiritual development. Um, this is facing the worst about us and, and moving forward. Uh, Madeline Langle, a Christian writer, says this. She says, growing up is a process that never ends. It isn't a point you attain so you can say, hooray, I'm grown up. And if you think of grown up, just think of Christ-like. That's the standard. And she writes, some people never grow up. It's not chronological, Right? Uh, but no one ever finishes growing, or you shouldn't. If you, if you stop, you might as well quit. Um, and then she writes these words. She goes, what I have to tell you is it never gets easier. It goes right on being rough forever, but nothing that's easy is actually worth anything. Amen. And what happens as you keep on growing is that all of a sudden you realize that it's more exciting and beautiful than it is scary and awful. A kind of contrasting quote is from the author F.B. Meyer, and he says this, he says, I used to think that God's gifts were on shelves, one above the other, and so that the taller we grew, the more Christian we grew in character as we continued to leap up higher and higher. But he says now he's learned that God's gifts are on the lower shelves, <laughs> the ones that we've got to bend down to get. And it's not a question of our adequacy in growing taller and taller and being able to leap higher, but it actually is our capacity for stooping lower and lower, and that we have to go down, 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 always lower to get the best gifts. That, that, that's the life of, of a crucified life that is identified with Jesus, that is willing to embrace that kind of humility. And this, this is what we find the Apostle Paul speaking of. Uh, he has the kind of humility that describes that sin remains a reality in his life. There's nothing good in his flesh. It trails him, it dogs him, and he's leaning hard into the spirit. But the final phrase of this is also the phrase of a believer where he cries out for deliv deliverance. He's, he says, well, he says, I find this law. When I want to do good, evil's present. But as a believer, he says, I delight in myself, in my mind, in my heart, when I have my full faculties in the beauty of God's law. That's, that's a believer writing that but I have this different law in parts of my body. Note that he doesn't say different law in parts of his true self, but he says this is, this is dogging him. There's this law that's, that's waging war against the, the law of his mind, and it takes him prisoner to the law of sin uh, and to the parts of his body. So he's describing this in a way that separates it from himself. He's embracing that this is not ultimately who I am. This is not ultimately who Jesus has made me. This is so important. But he's also not saying this has nothing to do with me. He's saying it's, it's right there. It's my shadow self. And, and so then he says, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from the body of death? Let me just say, I've never known a person who wasn't a believer cry that way. <laughs> I think you, you've got to be a believer and be introduced to a better way of life in Jesus Christ to say, I'm in a wretched condition. I want to be set free. And then say, who will rescue me? That is a believer who is 
humbled by defeat, who, who is, is humbled maybe by what a, you know, tiny margin of victory it was that launched them into obedience. <laughs> I think when, you, when you're leaning into Christ, what you often find is that, man, it was, it was, it was but a thin thread <laughs> that catapulted you from obedience to disobedience, what you wanted to do. Uh, that you were, you were won by that thin area. And so he, he cries out in this kind of deliverance, who will rescue me? And then gratitude. Thanks be to God. This is, this is the cry of a heart that has told the truth to itself and that has embraced the real, who they really are because they said, when Jesus comes, he's coming to rescue me. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. And, and then he gives this realistic summation to the whole thing. He says, with my mind, I serve the law, God. I agree with what's right. When I have my full strength and sanity and wits and I can evaluate and look at the, uh, at the benefits and the pros and cons and what will lead to greater harmony and beauty and what I'll feel better three days from now and what I'll feel better about three months from now and what I'll feel better about 3,000 years from now, my mind is clear. <laughs> I don't have any confusion, but there's this thing my flesh, this sabotage, and the law of sin, which, which continues to be a plague to me, continuing to come to him. So I want to give you a, a couple applications for this. This, this is real church. If, if this is the biography of one of the greatest Christians that have ever lived, then this is real church, and it ought to scrub the kind of idealism that sometimes causes people to want to fragment out of church. You see the reality of that? Uh, this is not idealistic, um, spirit-filled living. Now, he's not saying that every day you're just a conflicted mess, but he's saying that you should expect that when you are aspiring to walk with Christ, that this is part of your Christian experience. So again, I, I've known times when, sometimes it's on Sunday when, I'm, when we're worshiping and preaching, Sunday's an elevation of our spirits generally. Uh, other times it may be when I'm doing some yard work and I've got Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir, you know, resounding in my ears at higher decibel levels that are probably healthy, but I feel like, I, like, no, this is who I am. This is who I am, you know? You experience that, right? Audio adrenaline, intravenous praise worship, for a lot of people, that's, that's a language. And you say, this is who I am. But then you, you can find that that's turned off in a couple things. And maybe it's, you know, one of those robocalls or, uh, you know, a charge card that, you know, re-upped the charge that you thought had been taken off. And all of a sudden, you are in a snit. It doesn't take much to, to remove us from that. Um, the Bible doesn't idealize our experience, but also then, if that's true for you and me, and we need the grace that acknowledges that, then it's also true for all the people that we look around at in the church. So I remember a woman who had been hurt really badly by the church. And when we say hurt by the church, generally what we mean is hurt by some of the people who go to church, right? It's fairly rare. I haven't really seen it where the, the entire church has a meeting and circles up to do the same bad thing to someone. <laughs> Uh, but it's still serious. I'm not minimizing it. But her uh, teenage daughter said, Mom, why do you still go to church with uh, the reality of what some of those people did to you? And her mom answered this. Her mom said, well, I go to church because I refuse um, to let some people in Jesus' church um, determine my relationship to the whole of the church. And I refuse to let what some people do determine what I practice in terms of my relationship with the church for the rest of my life. And Eugene Peterson actually commented on this event as well, and he said this. He said, there's no person living, if you're, if you're a sold-out Christian in particular, but you don't have to be, you can just be an observant person in the world. There's no person living, if they look closely at the church, who will not have a problem with the church because there's sin in the church. In other words, if you said to me, I have no problem with myself, I think I have arrived, that, that would be an indication of serious problem, right? And if you said, I have, I have found the church that has no problems, then you just hang out a while longer <laughs> or be more part of it yourself. <laughs> so 
But here's what Peterson said. He says, the institution of the church is like the bark on a tree. There is an institutional life, but there's no life in the bark per se. It protects the wood. Uh, it protects the life of the tree, but the tree grows underneath. If you take the bark off, if you take the institution of the church, the place that can gather us to meet, to further uh, the mission of Christ, it's the only institution in our community that exists for the sole purpose of making disciples and reaching people who don't know Jesus Christ. There's no other organization that exists, but the church is that organization. And so it's prone to all kinds of disease, like a living organism. It's prone in modern terms to all kinds of narcissism. Uh, and, but the Bible refuses to idealize it but, but it describes it in all of its pages. So you will find that most of the New Testament was written to correct deficiencies in the lives of the church and often especially in the lives of leaders in the church. It's an example again of Jesus' inexhaustible love for the imperfect. So that's the first application. Don't idealize institutions. Secondly, what this should do is it should cause us to be a people who are thankful when we see the evidence of the life of the Spirit of God. Because when Paul says, there is no good in me, that is in regards to my flesh, when we see good, we are seeing the life of the Spirit of God. We, in other words, our expectations should be reconditioned by this text to say, when we see selflessness, when we see faithfulness over the long haul um, of lives that continue to pour themselves out, we should say that is evidence of the Spirit of God at work. And we should have the attitude of the Apostle Paul of thanksgiving um, for that. And thirdly, to our own selves, it reveals to us that simply knowing the truth is not enough to rid us of the continuing um, effect of the indwelling of, of our flesh with sin. Here's what uh, counselor Larry Crabb, who is, I think, a, one of the more excellent Christian counselors, passed away a few years ago, said. He said um, that he had to come to a place where he admitted that knowing the contents of the Bible is not even a sure route to spiritual growth. He said there's an assumption that if we just get the Bible into people's heads, uh, then the Spirit of God will apply it to hearts. But he says that assumption is never found in the New Testament uh, because we are called to actually tangle with our own human hearts and not remain safely hidden in rows of chairs or classrooms, uh, but to acquaint ourselves with the struggle of our human heart and to more greatly acquaint ourselves with the grace of Christ. So if we scrub out the idealism in the institution, we've also got to scrub out the superficial in our attitude to ourselves. It's, it's a lifelong project that will not end until Jesus returns and we see him and we become like him. Amen. And so we embrace, again, the awkward complexity and nuance of this text as part of our reality. You know, you cannot find a psychological textbook that is up to date if it's even five, 10 years old, right? You certainly couldn't find one that is decades or centuries old and say, yeah, they've nailed it. This is the conventional wisdom of the human heart. But when you look at the pages of the New Testament, the words of Jesus, the words of the Apostle Paul, uh, this is probably the most central and clear passage of teaching us about the reality of the human heart and sin. It is virtually unchallengeable as the reality and really the storyline and the background narrative to every novel and every story that has ever been written. And yet it calls us to, to the one place that there is hope. The one place there is hope is the kind of humility, uh, but who rests that we are fighting this battle not to gain a victory, but to actually experience the victory that has been won. We're not fighting for victory. We're fighting from the victory that Jesus has won, and he is coming to deliver us. And, and yet we live in this kind of complexity. I've got two more quotes I want to close with. The, the first one is, from A.W. Tozer, a great mystic and Christian writer of the last century. And he writes this about us, if you were in Christ, and if you're not in Christ, this is a description of what the Christian life is like. And he says this, he says, a real Christian is an odd number. A real Christian feels supreme love for one he has never seen. A real Christian talks familiarly every day to someone they cannot see. 
A real Christian expects to go to heaven on the virtue of another. A real Christian empties themselves to become full. A real Christian admits that they are wrong so they can be declared right. A real Christian goes down in order to get up. A real Christian is strongest when they are weakest. A real Christian is richest when they are poorest. A real Christian is happiest when they feel the worst. And a real Christian dies so that they can live, forsakes in order to have, gives away in order to keep. A real Christian sees the invisible, hears the inaudible, knows that which surpasses knowledge, and is, has met the God who is not looking for anything other than him. The real Christian is not looking for a light to come and shine, but upon him the light has already shined, and his assurance is one who knows that his experience of God is not hearsay or secondhand. A real Christian is not a copy, not a facsimile, but a real Christian is an original from the hand of the Spirit of God. I ask you, do, do you relate to that? Is that your title? It is, it is the most glorious storyline that we we can live martin luther put it this way he says you will have as much joy and laughter in your life as you have faith in god you will have as much joy and laughter in your life as you have faith in god doesn't mean you'll be free from pain conflict difficulty discouragements but to the degree you have faith in god you have joy and laughter and this will come this cry as we continue to cry it this is the mark of a christian who knows that, let's just say you had to send your children upstairs to await for a verdict of discipline, you know that as before you reach those stairs, as the parent, you're gonna need to repent three or four times before you actually address those children with corrective discipline. This is, this is Christianity. Who will deliver me? Not who will fix them. Who will help me navigate the line that is drawn in the midst of my own human heart? And it's the one who has the hope that when Jesus comes and when we see him, we will fully and only then be fully and finally made like him. Again, I really will close this time. These are the words from Waterbrook and a song that gripped my heart years ago. It says this about the second coming. It says, he will come. He will come and he will comfort all that's hardened, make my deserts into gardens, and we all will see his face. He will come. He will come and he will soften all the starkness. He will break the chambers of my darkness and we'll all be overwhelmed. They say, he will come, he will come. He'll remove his flaming garment and place it on the lowliest harlot. <laughs> That's me. That's you if you know yourself in Christ. He will take his flaming garment and he'll remove it and he'll place it on the lowest harlot, and it says, and we all will see his face. All my scars will turn to fountains and the valleys into mountains, and we all will see his face. So when you know this truth, you're able to tell yourself the truth. You're able to embrace your whole full reality in Jesus Christ, and you're able to continually cry out for deliverance and hope. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this word. Lord, it stands as a monument to your impeccable, perfect wisdom about the state of our human hearts. And thank you that you love us. Thank you that you are coming for us. Thank you that you will not be stopped. And thank you that one day we will experience the full deliverance of anything that is a shadow or less than the fullness of who we are made to be in Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.
before the beginning of time There's no point of reference Spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of life And as you speak A hundred billion galaxies are born In the vapor of your breath the planets form the stars were made to worship, so will I. I can see your heart in everything you've made. Every burning star, a signal fire of grace. If creation sings your praises, so will I. your promise don't speak in vain no syllable empty your voice once you have spoken nature and science follow the sound of your voice and as you speak Billion creatures catch your breath Evolving in pursuit of what you said If it all reveals your nature, so will I I can see your heart in everything you say Every painted sky, a canvas of your grace. If creation still obeys you, so will I. Yeah. So will I. So. The stars were made to worship, so will I. If the mountains bow in reverence, so will I. If the oceans roll your greatness, so will I. So will I. For if everything exists, so lift you high, so will I. Say it so well. If the rocks cry out in silence, so well. The sum of all our praises still falls shy. Chased down my heart through all of my failure and pride. Yeah, yeah. On a hill you created the light of the world, abandoned the darkness to die. And as you speak, come on. 
A hundred billion failures disappear Thank you God Where you lost your life so I could find it here If you left the grave behind you so will I I can see your heart in everything you've done Every part designed in a work of art called love If you gladly chose surrender, so will I I can see your heart a billion different ways Every precious one, a child you die to save If you gave your life to love and so will I Like you would again a hundred billion times But what measure could amount to your desire You're the one who never leaves the one behind What a great description of our God. He doesn't leave anyone, want to leave anyone behind. As, as you go, a uh, couple things. If you're new here, or maybe you haven't touched base with this for a while, on Wednesday night, we have a great meal and great classes. We just encourage you to come. It's a great way to have conversation. Uh, and uh, we're especially encouraging, if you're brand new, you haven't uh, sorted through the claims of Christianity or you'd like to redo that, there's still time to get it on the ground floor of our Alpha class. Uh, this might be the last week I say that in terms of the sequence, but uh, it's a great class and we have about 40 people going through it and you'd love to have the more the merrier. Secondly, encourage you to be early adopters and, and let's, let's make our children's staff faint at the amount of volunteers that come forth for Vacation Bible School. <laughs> um, let's be early adopters to that, this next generation. There's an opportunity virtually for all hands on deck in different ways, and they've got tables out here. And uh, if we can cause their next few weeks for them to be having to sort through the multitude of volunteers instead of tracking down volunteers, we will have a stronger VBS program. So I just wanna motivate you toward that. Uh, it's a great way to fulfill our mission and to leave no one behind, especially the next generation, the least. Uh, and now, um, uh, at the end, I invite you to receive prayer. But before we receive prayer, and if you're going to be one of our prayers, I invite you to come forward up to the front uh, to offer prayer. But we're going to do a benediction that is a response and a reading. So if you'd like to read with me uh, the congregational part. And the God we've met here is the God we take with us. And so, hear this. God is a gentle God. We go forth with this gentleness in our lives. God is a tender God. We shall be known as persons of tenderness. God is a forgiving God. We will bestow the gift of forgiveness in our relationships with others each day. We are made, you are made, we are made in God's image. We will live like we know that with joy and thanksgiving. And together, amen and amen. Go and live this out.